Father, we ask you that you may speak to us this morning by your word. For those who need repentance, that they may repent. For those who need encouragement, that they may be encouraged. Please, Lord, work in our hearts. In your name, amen. If you have your Bibles, please go to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. And we will, be, we will focus this morning uh, in verses 35, no, sorry, verses 31 to 35. Matthew chapter 13. going to read it once more. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is just like a, like a cheese that a woman took, took and mixed into a 30 kilograms of flour until it, it worked out all through the dough. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He didn't say anything to them without using a parable. So what was fulfilled was what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. By the mid of the 18th century, the Baptists, particularly the particular Baptists, or the so-called the Calvinist Baptists, in England have extended a lot. Particularly in the east of England and the south of England, the Baptists were one of the main denominations, including London. If you are aware of Baptist history, the Baptists suffer a lot of persecution at the end of the 17th century. They were even forbidden to go to universities in the great persecution that this country suffered in 1662. Beckles even had one martyr that was killed in the 17th century. However, something particular happened with a lot of the Baptist denomination in the middle of the 18th century. There was a popular doctrine called high Calvinism or hyper-Calvinism that became very popular among the Baptists in the 18th, mid of the 18th century. And basic, the basic teaching of the high Calvinism was as follows. Because man is dead in his sin and trespasses, and he can do anything for salvation, he cannot repent by himself, he cannot have faith by himself, so we, it's a waste of time to preach the gospel. We shouldn't actually encourage a person to repent and have faith in the gospel because the person cannot have faith in the gospel. So why to encourage someone to come to Christ if he actually cannot come to Christ? So this teaching was affecting deeply the Baptist churches in the middle of the 18th century. And I want to focus here on one man. His name was Andrew Fuller. He was born actually in the east of England, not that far from here, actually. He is regarded as the greatest Baptist English theologian of all time. He grew up in a farm. He never received theological education. He was self-taught. And Fula wrote a book that became fundamental in the foundation of the missionary movement of the 19th century. The name of the book was The Gospel Worthy of All Acceptance. And actually, when you go there, you will see that we have that book now in Spanish later when you walk that way. Andy Fuller wrote 
a refutation to the high Calvinism, to the hyper Calvinism. And for Fula, one of the key core messages of the gospel was that the gospel ought to be preached to every person. Now, he, he began thinking to every person, but he soon realized, and what about those who are overseas? What about those who have never heard the gospel? What about those in India? What about those in the rem farthest remote corners of the British Empire? So Andrew Fuller moved to Bristol, and when he was in Bristol, they began a communion of fellowship of pastors. And there were two people key in this fellowship of pastors. One of them was John Ryland, and the other one was a young man in his mid-twenties called William Carey. By this time, Andrew Fuller was already pushing missions, and William Carey was already really disappointed because he wanted to start a missionary movement to India. Sadly, the church of William Carey was a high Calvinist. So when William Carey went to the elders and said, I think that the Lord is calling me to go to India in missions to preach the gospel, the elders told Carey, young man, sit down. When God wants to convert the pagans, he will do it without your help. And that was the end for William Carey for missions. Andrew Fuller has a very different idea. And together they were praying, and they were sure that the Lord was were calling them to do missions overseas. By this time, 99% of Christianity live in the West. Only 1% of Christians live in non-Western countries. So they were praying, and in one of the prayer meetings, they were discussing who would be the most suitable man to go overseas, to begin a missionary movement to India. No one has attempted to do it before. It was something entirely new for the Baptists. In the middle of the meeting, William Carey stand up and said, okay, enough of this. I will go to the deepest hole. I will descend to the deepest hole if you hold the rope. If you hold the rope. And Andrew Fuller replied, we will. We will hold the rope. And that was the beginning of the London Missionary Society, right at the beginning of the 19th century. William Carey went to India, and he died in India. And Andrew Fuller was the one that supported the whole missionary enterprise that sent eventually hundreds and thousands of missionaries from the United Kingdom and later on from the United States to all over the world. Another man following the steps of William Carey, Hudson Taylor, was encouraged by Carey and went to China, starting a movement of hundreds of missionaries going to China. If you read something about the history of Andrew Fuller, something that is incredibly and remarkable about his life, he was just a poor man with an incredible faith in the Lord and a huge amount of sacrifice through this. Nowadays, almost 90% of Christians live in non-Western countries. The amount of people that are Christians in China, or India, or Peru, or South Africa, or Latin America, are counted by millions and millions and millions. And we can trace back all of this back to that prayer meeting where John Rilland, Andrew Fuller, and William Carey were praying together. No, even in his wildest dreams, Andrew Fuller would have ever thought that his prayers would be answered in this way. 
He died in 1815 in a little town near Bristol. Poor, but the Lord honored him. And it was through him and many others from this country, from the United Kingdom, that the gospel was extended to many nations around the world. And this is what I want to preach about this morning. The kingdom of God has come. The kingdom of God is here. And this parable in particular speaks about the growth of the kingdom of God, the growth in size and the growth in influence of the kingdom of God. If we look at the history of Christianity through 2,000 years, although there has been so much suffering and persecution, there is one common thing that permeates 2,000 years of history. The kingdom of God is growing. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And that's something that we have to bear in mind. That's something that we have to be constantly reminded. When I look at the state of the world, when I look at the news about abortion, homosexual marriage, and the laws that were passed last week in Northern Ireland, we can get easily discouraged. When we look at the state of the church and how weak we are, we can get easily discouraged. And when I look at myself and see how much sin still lives inside me, I can get even more discouraged. And they have you too. But then remember something. The Lord is still sitting on his throne. And these promises are truth. He is fulfilling his promises. He is extending his kingdom. And that leads us to our first point. This parable of the kingdom, this parable in Matthew 13, belongs to a section called the parables of the kingdom. The parables of the kingdom are a section in the book of Matthew, Mark, and Luke that deals with some characteristics and topics related to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is one of the most important themes of scripture related to the coming of Jesus Christ and the gospel. It is virtually impossible to understand the gospel without having a good understanding of the kingdom. Let me read you how Mark describes the coming of the kingdom. Mark 1.15. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the gospel. Repent and believe the gospel. Marx relate the truth of the gospel with the coming of the kingdom of God. In the Old Testament, the coming of the Messiah was related with the coming of the kingdom of God. The coming of the Holy Spirit was related to the coming of the kingdom of God. The preaching of the gospel to the Gentiles was related to the coming of the preaching of God. The kingdom of God. Sorry. And these parables illustrate all of these topics. So it's very important that we have a good understanding of what is the kingdom of God and what is actually the Lord saying here. But before we explain these parables and the meaning of the growth of the kingdom, I think it would be wise if we explain what the Lord is not saying here. <laughs> okay? What the Lord is not talking about. What is not the kingdom of God? And you think, let me tell you three things that the Lord is not saying here. The first one, the Lord is not saying here that the kingdom of God is a political kingdom. This is very important because through the centuries, some people have understood these passages as referring to of the kingdom of God in a political realms. I don't know if you have heard this doctrine called Erastianism. 
Well, Erastianism is basically the notion that the state has control or is the head of the church. In this case, Erastianism was developed at the end of the 16th century here in England, and it eventually become, became one of the main traits of the Anglican church, where actually the queen, the secular power, is the head of the church. So they tend to identify the growth of the kingdom with a political expansion of the kingdom. I don't think that is correct. And I don't know if there are any Anglicans here. I have a lot of good friends uh, in the Anglican church, but hence that's why I, I am a Baptist. <laughs> I am an independent. Um, the second one that the Lord is not saying here, he's not saying that the kingdom of God is a particular religion. So that this, the, the growth of the religion of the church is the same of the growth of the kingdom. This is sometimes the view of the Roman Catholic Church that placed the church over the state. So the more the growth church, the church grows, the kingdom grows. It's not exactly the same. And the third one, the law is not comparing the kingdom of God with a particular denomination, as much as I would like to as a Baptist. So the kingdom of God is not the Baptist church, it's not the Presbyterian church, uh, or it's not the charismatic church, or the Pentecostal, or any visible church. So what is the kingdom of God then? What is the Lord speaking here? Well, I think the main characteristic when you read what is the kingdom of God is the growth of the kingdom and the sovereign rule of God. The famous philosopher Charles Taylor, he wrote a book called A Secular Age. In this book, A Secular Age, Charles Taylor defined that the main characteristic of people living in Western societies is being secular. By being secular, he means the notion of not believing in any metaphysical realities, not believing in spirit, not believing in a soul, not believing in angels, not believing in demons, not believing in anything that is purely we see what we see with our eyes. If you look to a person walking there, a young man, and you, a non-Christian, and you ask, do you believe in a soul? You say, no, I don't believe in that. I only believe in what I can see. And this is a danger for us Christians, because we can tend to think in the same way when we think about Christianity. We can think that Christianity is just believing or not believing in something. The kingdom of God, we can think that is believing into a set of rules or not believing into a set of rules. Although Christianity is deeply engraved in theology, it's not just ideas. It's not just believing in something or not believing in something. What is at the core of the kingdom of God is power. Paul defined it, defines this in 1 Corinthians 4.20. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. But of power. Power to live Christian life, power to live in the power of the Holy Spirit, power to preach the gospel, power to, for the extension of the kingdom, that is what is at the center of the kingdom of God. And that is what the law is speaking here. The, kingdom, the growth of the kingdom of God is not just the growth of a theological idea or a philosophy or a set of values. It's the growth of the power of God to all men in all nations. And this is what the law is speaking here in the parable of the mustard seed. He is he's, he's basically saying that the beginning of the kingdom of God 
is very, very small, but it will grow beyond measure. He is talking about an illustration from an everyday life, Jewish culture. The first parable is talking about a man in a field, and the second parable is speaking about a woman at home. Both parables are fairly easy to understand for the first century Judaism. And the mustard seed was used as a proverb in the first century Judaism for its smallness. There was nothing smaller in those days than a mustard seed. It's not the smallest of all the seeds, but it's just a comparison of how small it is. The measure of a tiny mustard seed is one millimeter. Something really, really small. And the Lord is saying that although the kingdom may be that small, it will grow through the centuries. He wanted to emphasize and encourage the disciples how a tiny, weak, a small number of disciples in the first century can grow. Now it's important to say something about this. It's not the amount of faith that you have, but the object of faith. What is important in the seed is not the size, but the nature of the seed. What is important for us in the church is not how strong we appear to be, but the message we communicate. It's the message that we preach that the power has the power of the gospel. It's not how clever we are, but it's the message that we preach. We are just simple people, but what has the power to change the people is actually the nature of the seed, the gospel itself. Now, there is something interesting here in this passage. The Lord uses the word tree in Matthew uh, 13, a big tree. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field, verse 32. Though it's the smallest of all seed, yet when it grows, it's the largest garden plant and becomes a tree. If you read the other accounts in Mark and Luke, you will see that there is a missing phrase there. Mark and Luke don't include the word tree. It's only the account of Matthew that compares this mustard seed to a tree. In Mark and Luke, they compare to a bush or a garden tree. It's a different word in the original language. Now, when you read the commentaries, they try to explain this. If you read liberal commentaries that they actually don't believe much in scripture, I don't know why they write commentaries if they don't actually believe in the power of the scripture, they will say, oh, Matthew just, he was copying what Mark and Luke wrote, and he made a mistake. Uh, probably was a little bit sleepy, and he was copying what Mark wrote in his gospel, and then he, he added three. It's actually an addition. I don't think that's what happened here. I think it was intentional. The connection between tree and birds was a, has a very deep theological meaning in the Old Testament. I think Matthew is alluding here to several passages in the Old Testament. Let me mention some of them. Ezekiel 17.23, Ezekiel 31.6, Psalm 104, 12, Daniel 4, etc. Let me read you just one passage that I think that's, is what is going on here. Ezekiel 17, 23. On the mountain heights of Israel, I will plant it. It will produce branches and bear fruit and become a splendid cedar. Birds of every kind will nest in it. They will find shelter in the shade of its branches. What is talking Ezekiel here. So basically, Ezekiel, Psalms, Daniel, and other prophets compare the kingdom of God to a tree. 
a huge tree that holds birds from all kinds. Now, what were the birds that Ezekiel were, was speaking about? Most commentators think that the birds are a reference to the Gentiles, to the non-Jewish people. And I think this is what Matthew is speaking here, and is what the Lord is saying here with the mustard tree. The kingdom of God one day will include the Gentiles. And look at this building. How many of you are Jews? I think no one is raising his hand. There are several nationalities here. The gospel of God will include, include people of every nationality. All different ethnicities are included here. People from different backgrounds, male and female, rich and poor, black and white, yellow and brown, English and no English, people from all kinds and different backgrounds. And this is what the law is speaking here. And this is something that we must bear in mind at the moment of preaching the gospel. Because it's very easy, it's very easy to preach the gospel to people that we like or that are like us, isn't it? Like, if I am a young man, I like preaching the gospel to a young man, but I would feel very awkward to an elderly woman, rightly so. But when we are talking about the church, Beckles Baptist Church, we must bear in mind that the kingdom of God is open to everyone, and everyone needs to hear the message of the gospel. The first time I went to the Amazon jungle, I was, I think, 19 or 20. I was crossing the Amazon jungle in a ship, and we were stopping in several villages, and we were preaching the gospel, and I was teaching there uh, something basic of systematic theology to pastors. We busy there, and I remember going with uh, an English missionary, and we went to visit deep into the jungle, and we saw this tree called Capot tree. The Capot tree is the biggest tree in the Amazon jungle. It has around of 80 meters high. Can you imagine 80 meters high? I don't know how much is in feet. 250? Something like that. It's very tall anyway. It produces at any time 500 fruits. And each fruit contains 200 seeds. In every one of these trees, there are 10,000 seeds at any time of the year, every day of the year, all day, year, all year long. And this tree lives for 800 years. There are thousands and millions of seeds. And you have birds from all kinds. And from a tiny seed, you can have a massive tree. That is what the Lord is speaking here. And the second parable, going more briefly, is the growing of the leaven dot. The, go the growing of the leaven growth. The yeast is a symbol in the Old Testament. Sometimes it has negative connotations, but I think that's not the case here. It's talking about something that grows, and the connotation is a positive connotation. Yeast was used in the offerings in the Old Testament in Leviticus. Sometimes when they presented an offering to the Lord, they put yeast on it. Let me read you Leviticus 7, 14. It's talking, um, 15. It's talking about the thanksgiving offering that is presented to the Lord, and it was presented with loaf of bread made with yeast. And it has the connotation of offering to the Lord. And what is speaking the Lord here? Well, he is repeating the same teaching here in two different ways. In the first one, he's speaking about the growth of the kingdom in the parable of the mustard seed. And in the parable of the yeast, He's speaking about the growth of the influence of the kingdom of God. <clears throat> the 
the point of this parable is that the kingdom of God is unseen. We cannot see. Now, I am not a great cook. I am a better eater than a cooker. Uh, but I know something about kitchen and cooking. Now, let's imagine that I put, I'm going to bake something, probably the ladies or someone who cooks know more about it, and you put a massive amount of dough. According to this, is there are different uh, ways to, uh, the NIV, the version that you have here, translated verse uh, In verse 33, he says 30 kilograms of flour. Well, it says three measures of satons, actually. That is actually the translation here. But three measures of saton can be, a saton is a measure of measuring dot that can have between 30 to 17 kilograms. So it can be up to 50 kilograms that the law is speaking there. Something big, basically, a lot of mass. And imagine that you put a lot of yeast there, okay? And you put that yeast in the fridge and leave it to the next day, isn't it? So that the dough may grow a lot more. The dough grows in the fridge at night and you don't see it. It's growing every minute, but you don't see how much it's growing. Likewise, is with the kingdom of God and the gospel. When we become a Christian, a Christian, sometimes we don't see a massive growth from night to morning. But along the years, we can see growth in our life. Likewise, with the gospel in Ireland, we cannot see much growth from one day to the other. And it's easily to become discouraged. Oh, nowadays in the United Kingdom and England, we can see no much growth. Why I am preaching this sermon when I don't see conversions? Why I am doing this when I can do something different? Why is it worth to sacrifice my money for the kingdom of God? Why is it worth to serve in the Sunday school? Why is it worth to preach the gospel? Why is it worth? And this is so true, particularly for people, young people. There's so much temptations there. Why is it worth to say no to temptation and sin? There is a hidden growth of the gospel that you cannot see. Now let's imagine that I go back next day to the fridge and I open the fridge and I'm going to take out the load, all the load, sorry, and I'm expecting to grow a lot because I put a lot of yeast and I'm expecting to double its size or triple. So I go very, very excited the next morning and I open the fridge and it hasn't grown at all. It hasn't moved at all. So I don't know what you, but I would think, this juice is rubbish. The lady that has sold it to me in Tesco, this is rubbish. It doesn't serve at all. Like, nothing has happened with the mass. Like, it should have doubled itself, tripled. Oh, I just, I would be really, really upset with this. The gospel is not that juice. The gospel will grow. The kingdom of God will grow. The gospel has power. Sometimes we think in that way about the power of the gospel. We don't expect results. We pray because we have to pray, but we don't really, really believe that the Lord can actually do something to our prayers. We preach the gospel we have because we have to preach the gospel, and we do missions because that's what we are supposed to do, but the gospel is not bad Jesus because it's not related to our power, cleverness, but it's related to the message of the power of the gospel. There it lies the power. It's God who grows his kingdom through us. It's God, the one who executed 
his plans. The gospel is no but Jesus. And that's actually a great encouragement for us this morning. But also, it's something that must frighten some of you. And it's a great wound. Because if some people claim that they have received the gifts of the gospel years ago, and there is no growth. There is no growth. They still keep living in the same sins. There is no an inch of mortification of sin. There is no an inch of growth. And years gone by, and they keep living the same and the same and the same. Let me ask you a question. Have you really received the gifts of the gospel? Because it will produce fruit. It will grow. And this is an encouragement for us, but also a warning for us in this morning. And let me finish with verses 34 and 35. Just to close the meaning of this parable. Jesus spoke all these things to the crown in parables. He didn't say anything today without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. Now, what is the Lord saying here? Well, the Lord, most of, most of people are agree. I think the Lord is talking the interpretation of the Old Testament since the creation of the world through his days interpret through parables. And he is quoting Psalm 78 there. Now, when, when a Jewish rabbi quotes the Old Testament, it's very different from when we quote. Like, when we quote, like, we can quote a book, no, and we put, like, bold letters and the reference there, and we are quoting literally what that person is saying in that book. That's not how they quote it. When, when, the, when, when you see quotations or allusions to the Old Testament, they refer to a particular verse, but they are referring to the whole context on which that verse was written. So when the Lord is mentioning Psalm 78, he's referring to the whole of the Psalm 78. Now, when you look at Psalm 78, that is the reference here, in Psalm 78 is the history of Israel and the delivery of God and the expectancy of the Messiah and how the Lord executed his judgment in Exodus and brought his people and they, they were expecting that the Lord may actually produce a second Exodus and will bring them back from captivity is what we call a psalm of the history of redemption. It's the whole history of the people of Israel in the Old Testament in one chapter. Now, what is the Lord saying here? The Lord is basically reinterpreting the main themes of the Old Testament in relationship to the coming of the kingdom of God by speaking in parables. And why is he speaking in parables? Well, if you read the scriptures, the parables have the power that some people understand them and obey. And some people actually hear the parable, and they don't understand the parable, and they don't produce growth. And that is the core meaning of the parable of the sower. The parable becomes a blessing for those who understand the parable and obey the parable. But it becomes a means of curse for those who hear the parable and disobey the parable. And this is for us today. You hear the message of the gospel. You hear about the growth of the kingdom of God. And if we pay attention to these words and we obey them, the Lord, there is a blessing for us. 
but also if we choose not to listen to the message of the gospel, it becomes a warning and a curse for us. So let me encourage you with some things. The first one, Christian, when you feel discouraged because you don't see any external growth in the kingdom, remember that the growth of the kingdom is hidden. Oh, we pay so much attention to music, Instagram, Facebook, big things. The kingdom of God grows very, very hidden and very softly. So take courage on that. We are the G's of the world. We are the means by which the kingdom of God grows. We ought to preach the gospel with our words. We ought to say then the message of the kingdom. We are not the kingdom of God, but we point the people outside there towards the gate of the kingdom of God, towards the King Jesus. Finally, the last reminder for us is the kingdom of God will win. The kingdom of God will win. Not all the powers of this world will be able to quench the kingdom. Not even death will be able to quench the kingdom. Not our own sin will be able to quench the kingdom. So if you are here in this morning and you feel discouraged, you feel the weight of age coming to you and the imminence of death approaching and how our bodies are decaying, now remember that there is a future resurrection of the body. We will and we have inherited the kingdom of God that is prepared for us. We will receive a new body and we will live forever with the king. And in light of this, we should take courage and be encouraged today to live in light of this reality and sacrifice for the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these words and we thank you for the growth of the kingdom. And Father, I ask you that those who feel discouraged or need encouragement this morning may find encouragement in these words, Lord, that they may be encouraged by your sovereign hand and power. And Lord, I ask you also for those who are not living a Christian life in the way they should, that they may actually be warm and be actually learn how to fear you and may repent of their sins and follow you. Please, Father, help us to keep our eyes in you and what you are doing overseas and here among us and how your kingdom is growing powerfully.